In problem one, find four consecutive integers such that twice the sum of the first and third is 20 greater than three times the second. First thing I'm going to notice here, it says find four consecutive integers. Um, integers are numbers that are non-fractions. Consecutive integers go up one at a time. So if I let n represent some integer out there, if I add 1 to that, that's the next biggest integer. For example, 9. 9 plus 1 is 10. 9 plus 2 is 11. 9 plus 3 is 12. And just like that, I've created a set of four integers using the same letter that are consecutive. Um, once I've established what they look like algebraically, now I see the word such that, which means an equation is coming. We start looking for words. Twice the sum means 2 times a sum. And we're adding the first and the third. The first is n, the third is n plus 2. So we take n, which is the first, add it to the third, which is n plus 2. Then it says is, which is an equal sign always. And then it has the words 20 greater than, which don't matter yet. And then finally it says 3 times the second. The second is n plus 1. So, oops. Sound the wrong spot equals. All right. <clears throat> so 3 times a second, I need to multiply 3 times n plus 1. n plus 1 is more than one thing, so I need parentheses around it to multiply it by 3. So uh, that's just a, a hidden parentheses that's going to happen a lot of times. If I want to multiply anything times this or this or this, parentheses have to go around the multiplication. And then finally, the 20 greater than happens after the word is, which means we're going to put a plus 20 on the far right hand side. If it said 20 less than, it would have been minus 20. So that's part of one to get the equation written. And then once we've gotten the equation written, now we're going to start simplifying. For me personally, I like to add like terms inside of parentheses before I distribute. So I'm going to keep the 2 out there. n plus n is 2n. 2 doesn't have a like term in the parentheses. And then I've got 3 times n. 3 times 1 makes 3n plus 3 plus 20 outside the parentheses, so it's not um, being dealt with yet. On the left-hand side, now I have a distributive property to do here. 2 times 2n is 4n, 2 times 2 is plus 4. I'm here adding like terms, 3n plus 23. And then what's left to do is get n equals, so I'm going to move the 3n over here and the 4 over there to get all the letters on that side, all the numbers on this side. 4n minus 3n makes 1n, 23 minus 4 equals 19. We should expect an integer answer, that's what should happen on these problems. n is the first integer 19, plus 120, plus 221, plus 3, 22. So 19, 20, 21, 22 is the end result. And again, if you stop here, you haven't given me the, the answer because it says find four consecutive integers. I'm looking for four consecutive integers. So what I'm finding is the first one, then I just add one, two, and three to get the next three. Number two, 78% of the more successful students tended to be serendipitous. Okay, so it says percent of, so that makes it a part whole. So what we're looking for here is what the part and what the whole are. So it's real simple to find out these things um, when we're looking at these. All right. When it says some percent of something, the something represents the whole group. And then whatever it says after that tends to be the characteristic the group has. So 78% are serendipitous of the more successful students. The more successful students is 100%. So if I'm doing a part whole here, serendipitous, not serendipitous, and then more successful students. So looking just at that first sentence, 78% of the more successful students, so the more successful students represent the whole group, so 100%, tended to be serendipitous, that's who gets the 78%. And if 78% were serendipitous, that means 22 were not serendipitous. Next, it says there were 16,200 more successful students in the district. How many tended to be serendipitous? Okay, I put this row in, but it's not really necessary. All I need to do is figure out the number of serendipitous students in the district. 
So if I were to set up the proportion, 78 over 100 is going to equal x over 16,200. And then I'm going to get a calculator to help me with that. If I cross multiply, obviously that product's 100x. That's easy. That's not what I'm getting the calculator for. The other product, 78 times 16,200, a little bit more challenging. 1,263,600. So then we simply divide both sides by 100. It's going to chop these last two zeros off. So 12,636 students in the district are serendipitous. Number three, an urn contains nine gold coins and five silver coins. A coin is drawn at random and not replaced, then another coin is drawn. What is the probability the first coin will be gold, the second, gold, gold, or second coin silver? So, probability of the first gold, or coin being gold and the second coin being silver is what we're looking for. The initial setup of the problem is we have an urn that has nine gold and five silver. Okay, we're reaching into the urn, and the rules are that a coin is drawn at random and not replaced, then another coin is drawn. So we're drawing two coins, one at a time, we're not going to replace the first coin. We're going to just grab a coin out, get it, and then we get what we get, and then we set it aside, and then we're expecting it to pick again. So the first probability I have to deal with is the first pick. So the first pick we want to get, we want the first coin to be gold. So the chance of getting gold on the first pick is nine gold coins out of a total of 14 coins. Okay, with a not replaced coin, we always assume we got what we were looking for. So I wanted to get a gold coin. I got a gold coin. So now this is the urn after I picked the gold coin out and I didn't replace it. Now there's only eight gold coins. There's still five silver coins. In my second pick, I'm trying to get a silver coin. So the number of silver coins is five and the number of coins altogether, eight plus five is 13 coins. Okay. Next thing to do is to reduce, if possible, um, Three and five are the only numbers to divide the top, and those numbers do not divide the bottom, so there is no reducing this. So it's just a matter of multiplying. So top times top makes 45. Bottom times bottom is 182. And that's the probability of getting gold first, silver second. On the test, you should expect to be picking two coins, probably gold first, silver second, not replacing. What I'm going to change is how many coins there are to begin with. So um, it should work similarly to this. Number four, two dice are rolled. What's the probability that the sum of the numbers rolled is a seven? All right, so um, our chart that we've created for this, one, two, three, four, five, and six, that's every outcome you can get on one die. And one, two, three, four, five, six, every outcome you can get on the other die. So this is individual dice. The top die, 1 through 6, the, the, the second die, 1 through 6. We get the sum of the numbers by adding them up. So 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 1 plus 3 is 4, and so on. What's in black represents the uh, sample space of this situation. So what's in black represents every possible numerical outcome of rolling two dice. You roll two dice, you can get anywhere from a 2 through a 12. Nothing bigger than 12 is possible, nothing less than 2 is possible. And um, there's a total of 6 by 6, so 36 outcomes possible. And what we want is the sum of the numbers to be 7. So if we look and see all the 7s that we get, and be careful that we only, only count what's in black here because, again, 1 through 6 in blue, 1 through 6 in blue represent each individual die. We add those together to get the actual sum. So there's six ways, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 ways to get 7. So there's six sevens out of 36 outcomes. That reduces to 1, 6 for the probability of getting a 7 when you roll two dice. Number 5 and 6 are both graphing problems. And the way, way we just learned how to do this is the slope-intercept method of graphing. Just to highlight that, we need y equals everything else, which we have on number five ready to go. This number that's right here represents our y-intercept. 
our y-intercept is simply on the y-axis, positive 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up. This is 0, negative 1, negative 2, and so on. There's values along this y-axis, just like in a regular number line. Whatever this number is, is the point that you want to graph on that number line. So positive 1 lies right there. I'm graphing positive 1 because that's what the constant value is there. The second number here is my slope, which is positive 2 over positive 3. Okay. Slope tells me rise over run. The top number pluses up, minus is down. The bottom number pluses right. And minus is left. All right, so I've got a positive two-thirds slope. So I start at the point, the y-intercept I've just plotted. So whatever this point is creates a point on the line you're looking for. Then from that point specifically, you apply the slope. So up to right three. Up to right three, that doesn't quite fit. I could also imagine a positive slope being a negative over a negative. That would take me down two and left three because both negative down two left three. So if I'm at this point, go down two left three, that's also a point on the line. I don't care how many points you get, just give me the right line, but you need at least two points to create a good line. So get your y-intercept, apply the slope to get at least one more point. If you want to get an extra point, that's fine. And then just connect the dots with a nice straight line like so, and there's your graph. Keep in mind, if the slope is positive, you should be expecting the graph to be going upward as you move to the right. A negative slope is going downward as you move to the right. Number six does not already have y equals, so the first thing I would do here is get this to say y equals, so I'm going to move the 3x over to the other side. y stays on the left, equals stays right where it's at. 3x moved to the right becomes positive because it's negative on this side. Minus 2 is staying right where it's at, it stays negative. I like my number in front of x to be a fraction, so if I'm going to do slope-intercept method of graphing, I want to make sure that looks like a fraction. Once again, this number with no x attached to it is my, my y-intercept. I find my y-axis. I start at 0. I want to go to negative 2. That's my y-intercept. My slope this time is 3 over 1. Again, positive slope. That's up and right. Again, that could be negative 3 over negative 1 also. That's down and left. It doesn't matter which one you do. So if I go up 3, right 1, I can go up 3, right 1 again. Don't have enough room to go better there again. I could go down 3, left 1. They're all laying on the same line, so again, you just simply need to get enough points that you are sure that your graph is right, and then just connect the dots with a nice straight line, arrows on the ends of the line. Number seven, writing a number in scientific notation. We have a abscissa that's not between one and ten. Currently, the decimal point is located right here, and we want it to be located right there. So the first job is to relocate the decimal point in the right spot. And we have to count how many spaces we moved, which is three spaces. We also have to imagine what we did in the number. So 3,700 became 3.7. Our really large number, 3,700, got three spaces smaller to 3.7. If we make this number smaller, we have to make this number bigger. So I have to add 3 to 9. So I'm going to get times 10 to the 12th power. You should expect the number to start off looking somewhat like this, already a scientific notation structure, except this number is not going to be in the right form. It's got to be between 1 and 10. Create the right form, and again, if you make this smaller, you make that bigger. If you make this bigger, you make that smaller, by however far you moved it. Okay. Uh, once again, the last test had a lot of factoring. This one has a lot of factoring on it. Uh, most of the factoring, if not all of them on this test, if I recall, have common factors. So always look for a common factor first. Uh, the other thing you want to focus on is structure of the polynomial to get an idea of what type of factoring might be important to help you set it up well. So if I'm looking at this problem here, the first thing I notice is this is binomial. It's only two terms. The only way I can factor binomial at this point other than a common factor is a difference of squares. And with a difference of squares, the first thing I'm looking for is I want that minus to be in the middle. So I'm going to rearrange this problem like so. So the minus is now located in the middle, um, and that's where I want it to be every time. 
And again, before I start factoring any other way, I always look for a common factor. Does something evenly divide both numbers or both letters? And obviously, 2 goes into both numbers. That's a common factor. y squared minus 16x squared is left over. The check for a difference of squares is very simple. Number one, it has to be a difference, in other words, subtraction. Number two, everything has to be a perfect square. y times y, 4 times 4x four, times x, everything's a perfect square. So, I'm going to underline this in red. This expression is a difference of squares. It has a specific factored form. Difference of squares always has one sum, one difference. And what goes here are the numbers that make this by square rooting it. So y times y makes y squared. And what goes here is whatever makes this squared. So 4 times 4x times x, so 4x and 4x. And also, the common factor is part of the answer. So you took the two out, but it's still part of the factor form. Uh, do make sure you do that. And that's, that's what it's going to look like. Uh, number eight on the test, more likely to be a difference of squares. Uh, more than likely to have a common factor, so be looking for that. I'm looking for a factored form that looks like that. And again, 1 plus, 1 minus. This is a negative 16x squared. Notice these opposite signs create a negative. The same signs create the positive y squared. Uh, everything as it, as it should be in that situation. Number nine, once again, focusing on structure, I'm noticing this is a quadratic trinomial. In fact, it's a cubic trinomial to start off with, so x cubed plus 11x squared plus 30x. <clears throat> now, with the trinomial, I said quadratic, which means the second power is the highest power. If I see it's not a quadratic, we don't have the ability at this point to factor anything that is, is not quadratic. Um, I'm going to expect a common factor to drop that power down. So x to the third, x to the second, x to the first. x to the first is a common factor. If I take that out, x squared plus 11x plus 30 is left over. At this point, once I've figured out that much, I'm trying to find two numbers that multiply to make positive 30, whose sum is negative 11, or sorry, positive 11. Okay, so to make a positive number, they have to have the same sign. To be a positive 11, they have to both be positive. And if you can find those numbers immediately, great. More power to you. Um, at this point, you should be getting those more and more often just pretty quickly. If not, you're not practicing enough, so maybe practice a little more. So x plus 5 times x plus 6 is the factored form of this quadratic trinomial. x, the common factor, is still part of the solution. You factor completely. You want to put every factor in there. Do not leave any factors out. So greatest common factor is part of the answer. The quadratic factor is part of the answer. That would be it. Number 10, same situation. It's trinomial. Notice that the terms are out of order. So the first thing I would do on this problem is rearrange it. I want to put my highest power first, followed by my next highest power, and then in this case, followed by a constant. So 2x squared plus 30x plus 112. Once again, 2 and 30 and 112 all divide by 2, so a common factor of 2 in this case. x squared plus 15x plus 56. Divide everything by 2, and you can see that we get that. And an alternative to the chart, if you're finding the numbers immediately every time anyway, is this. You can just establish what those numbers are. 7 times 8 makes 56 when you multiply. 7 plus 8 makes positive 15 when you add. There's the two numbers, the magic numbers that we need. So x plus 7, x plus 8 is the factored form of this. And then again, the 2 is a common factor that is part of the solution. Make sure that goes out in front. Number 11, px squared plus px minus 12p x squared, x to the first, 12, no x at all, p, 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 so there's a p in every term. So that tells me right away there's a common factor of p. If I take the common factor of p out of every term, what's left from this is x squared. What's left from this is going to be plus 1x. What's left from this is going to be minus 12. Keep in mind, this is a 1x here. So when we're trying to find that number that those things add up to, we're looking for a positive 1. So to make a negative 12, I need a positive 4 and a negative 3. 4 times negative 3 makes negative 12 we're looking for. If we add the numbers, 4 plus negative 3 algebraically add up to positive 1. 
So those are the two magic numbers. So this quadratic trinomial factors to x plus 4, x minus 3, and the p is a common factor that's going to be out in front as part of the answer. So again, each of those factoring problems had a um, greatest common factor. There were three quadratic trinomials, one difference of squares. Be prepared for that. Number 12, uh, we have a system of equations with subscripted variables. Most of you don't like those. So again, what I would do is rewrite the problem using the subscripts themselves as the variables. Okay, so this is going to become n equals q plus 15, that top equation. The other thing I notice on this, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you this should happen on the test also, 5 and 25 and 585 all divide by 5. That will happen on the test also. Dividing by 5 is not a requirement, but it makes the problem easier to deal with. So when I rewrite this bottom equation, I'm going to multi I'm going to sorry, divide by 5 as I rewrite it with these non-subscript variables. So if I do 5 divided by 5, I get 1n. If I do 25 divided by 5, I get 5q. Well, I should say plus instead of equals. So 5 divided by 5, 1n plus 5 divided by 5 is 5q equals, and then 585 divided by 5 is going to be 117. All right, so that red equation is equivalent to the blue equation, the bottom equation here. Again, I just divided by 5, divided by 5, divided by 5, and again using n and q for my variables instead of n sub n and n sub q. Um, as far as the structure is concerned here, which technique would I prefer to use? I personally would like to use substitution here because this says n equals this expression, so that expression can be replaced n for this n. So if I do that, this bottom equation, n becomes q plus 15. Everything else plus 5q is equal to 117 stays the same. If I move the 15 over to the other side, I get 6q on this side is equal to 102. Divide both sides by 6, I get q is equal to 17. And once I know what q equals, I can go right there to find out what n equals. So n is going to equal q, which is 17 plus 15, so n is equal to 32. So n sub n equals 32, n sub q is equal to 17. There's our two solutions. Number 13, we're simplifying, and what I'm looking at here is that number is factorable. It's not a prime number. Where this number is a prime number, I can't make that any simpler than what it is. So this expression is as simple as possible, but this other expression can be fixed. So if I take this expression and think about that 45 first, 45 is 5 times 9. 5, of course, is prime. 9 is 3 times 3. This is the prime factorization of 45, so if I rewrite my problem, 8 times the square root of 5 plus, I'm going to leave a little space here, 7 times the square root of 45, but instead of 45, I write 3 times 3 times 5. And what we're looking for to simplify a radical is a pair of numbers inside, allows us to extract one outside to multiply by what's already out in front. So the 7's already out in front, I'm pulling the 3 out in front with it, that'll multiply together. The 5 didn't have a pair, so nothing happens to it. So the problem becomes, this is going to be 8 times the square root of 5. This is going to become 21 times the square root of 5. And if those were not the same radical, I'm done at this point. But since they're both the square root of 5, now I can add 8 and 21 to get 29 times the square root of 5 as my final simplified expression. Expect on the test for these to be the same radical. So if you don't get the same, more than likely you factored wrong. So uh, be careful that that happens. Um, maybe both of them factor on the test, but uh, that type of factoring is necessary in order to get these to be the same number so you can add or subtract them. <clears throat> number 14, a, sol a solving equation. Uh, the one sticky part of this one that might mess people up is right here. Minus minus means plus plus. Um, that's still a positive 3 being distributed through that parentheses. I would go ahead and make it plus plus before I distribute. So now if I distribute, I'm going to get a positive 3 times this and a positive 3 times that. Get what I get. 
Out here, I got a minus sign out in front, which is going to distribute through also. So it's going to change the signs inside that parentheses. And right here, nothing's happening right now, so I'm just going to bring that down. So first step, x plus 7 stays exactly as is. 3 times negative x makes minus 3x. Three, 3 times negative 6 makes minus 18. Minus times 3x makes minus 3x. Minus times minus 2 makes plus 2. So that's how that ha that's handled. I expect the structure to be similar on the test, just different numbers more than likely. Uh, but some of the same sign issues, of course, this minus minus thing will happen on the test. There'll probably be a negative in front of that parenthesis there. So that's how you handle those. Next step I would deal with would be adding like terms on the left-hand side. So I've got x and minus 3x. So this is 1x minus 3x makes negative 2x. I got plus 7 minus 18 opposite sign, so I subtract to get minus 11. Both cases, the bigger number negative, so 1 and negative 3, 3 is bigger, so it's negative. 7, negative 18, 18 is bigger, so it's negative. Over on this other side, nothing's happening, but I still bring it down, so I got my whole problem moved down to the next line. Uh, next, I would move the 11 to the right, the 3x to the left, or 2x to the right and 2 to the left, take your pick. I like my x's on the left, so I'm going to do that. So I'm moving 3x to the left becomes plus 3x. Moving the 11 to the right becomes plus 11. Negative 2x plus 3x makes 1x. If you want to write the 1, you can. Um, 1x and x mean the same thing. I'm just going to write x equals. 2 plus 11 is 13. These signs were different, so I subtracted. 3 is bigger, so it's positive. These signs are the same, so I'm adding 11 is bigger, so it's positive. If there were a number in front of x other than 1, at this point I'd divide by it, but there isn't, so that's the final solution to that one. And number 15, find the volume of this right triangular prism. So when they go to the trouble of giving you an adjective to describe the prism, it says triangular, it's telling you what the base is. The base is this triangle. Okay, the other triangle, if we were to imagine, would be back here, sort of like so. so kind of imagine this tri triangular prism there with that other base being way back there. That tells me that this dimension here is the height of the prism because that other triangle's over there, triangle one, triangle two, base is separated by height. So the height of this thing is 8 centimeters. I'm just going to write the number for now. The other thing I need to know is the area of the base. The base is a triangle. The area formula for a triangle is 1 half times its base times its height. This triangle here has a base of 6. It's got a height of 4. So half of 6 is 3 times 4 is 12. So 12 is the area of this triangle. H, the height of the prism. Volume is area of base times height. So the volume in this case would be 96. Unit is centimeters. Volume is cubic units, so centimeters cubed. On the test, it will be a triangular prism. I'm going to ask you to find volume. The triangle will have an area based on the base and height of that triangle, and the height of the prism will be sitting right there on the test. Prepare. I don't know how much easier I can make those problems. So um, that's what it's going to look like. I'm going to change the numbers. So be prepared and you should be fine.